It's always kind of seemed to me, please have a seat, that, uh, that uh, perhaps the murder of Kitty Genovese was something that hovered over the production. Yeah, I'm sure it, uh, am I on? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that that inspired the writer, actually, in the Genovese killing in New York. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure that happened. It's very weird for me. I just did something I never usually do. I sat through the whole movie, and I've never done that in years. It's been a long time since I really saw it, and it was, it's been a very emotional experience for me as well, so it, it's a really weird. It was a seminal movie in my life. I don't know why or how, why I ended up doing this film, and uh, why I was glad I did it, and a whole lot of reasons, but it's, uh, you know. Anyway, any questions you have to ask me or anything I can answer for you? Sure. Coming off of one potato, two potato, what did draw you to this, or how did you get involved? Well, I'll tell you, I did one potato, two potato, and it was quite a hit. It, uh, we won the Cannes Film Festival Best Actress Award. We came back to this country, and the film sold as a result of the Cannes Film Festival. And it opened in the United States, and we were a big success. And I was a big success, and I couldn't get a job. <laughs> They showed the film in Hollywood when I tried to sell it there, and everybody ducked. Then they all said, oh, wonderful, oh, we're so proud of you, and, and I couldn't get arrested. So I sat around for over a year, and then, happily enough, my agent started to get me television jobs. That's when I started doing Batman and Green Hornet and Run For Your Life and all kinds of, I did about God knows how many of them, and it was great, because what it did for me was prepare me in a sense. It taught me my trade so that I was able to do this film, which was an extraordinarily complex film to do, despite the fact that it's in one simple looking set, basically, and we never leave it. And I had the set constructed so that it couldn't open. I don't know if you know about making movies, but we have things we call wild walls, so you can pull them out and get your camera. And I, I insisted that we didn't do it that way. They locked the car down and made it just like a real car. We were inside with our cameras, and if our cameras didn't fit, we changed the shots to make them work. So, and it's a, it was highly complicated. The, the piece was, as you can understand, it's a set. The New York subway system wouldn't allow us near them. They wouldn't permit it. They kept saying things like, "This don't happen in New York." Or, uh, I know, and it's certainly not on the subways. They allowed us. They couldn't stop us from walking our casted characters up the stairs and in, into the stations, but they wouldn't let us get on with our equipment. So, all those shots on the real subway are stolen and with cameras lying off back and we walked our actors up and did all that stuff but that that was it but the car was totally constructed it was about I'd say five sixth the size or approximately of a real car we had to make it smaller otherwise I'd have needed so many people and it would have ruined the film but it was on a turntable we had one rear screen all that stuff out those windows is rear screen projection that's all stolen shots that Jerry Hirschfeld went out with a camera in a suitcase and in a box and shot all those shots. We stole all of that stuff. And what we did was it, the car was a mirror image. You know those ads that run along the top of the subway? They are direct opposites as you looked at it so that we could flip the car and it still would work. It's, very, it's a very complicated thing. The left to rights and right to lefts and all the looks. and It was extraordinarily complicated, but it worked. Wonderfully, I thought so. It made me happy. You mentioned Jerry Hirschfeld, the cinematographer. This was released in 1967, and the only studio film I can think of that year that was shot in black and white is In Cold Blood. Yeah, I meant was that there must have been some pressure to uh, yeah, there shoot was in color. pressure. There was pressure to shoot it in color. We shot it in color, and it just didn't work for us. I, I just felt it was the wrong thing. I thought if ever a film was made for black and white, it was this film. It made it bleaker and darker and without giving you any chance to escape what I felt was the needed intensity inside of that car. And they, and they let us do it. Uh, 20th Century Fox, that's a long story in itself. The film started as an independent film, and uh, we got ready, we cast the film, we rehearsed the film, we started to shoot. 
and we shot in order. We shot all of those exterior scenes first, each couple coming to the car and doing as luck would have it. We did all of that, and we were ready to start inside the subway car, and they called me and said, well, don't come in early today. We're having a problem. I said, i got to see dailies. Oh, you'll have plenty of time. Come in and we'll explain. We get, they run out of money, and they were broke, and all our checks, my check and all the actors' checks were bouncing, and so we had to shut down. And we then went out and tried to get money to make the film, and what had happened was David Brown, who ended up as... Sells as, as, as Dick Zanuck's partner, is Zanuck Brown. They made a list of extraordinary films. He was a great man and a terrific guy. And he had, a, before I even came on the project, he had said he loved the project. And if they were ever interested in going for a, a release through a company like Fox, they'd be, he would do his best to do something with it. Well, we went back to him, and I went and saw him, and he saw the dailies and said he thought it was terrific. He called Dick Zanuck on the coast. Zanuck said, bring the stuff out. And so I flew out with the stuff, and we had had time to cut those scenes together. And we showed this. I walked in, and we sat down, and he said, Dick Zanuck was a wonderful guy. And he never did anything. He never got in the way. He never stopped us from doing anything in the film. And he looked at the film and okayed us and gave us the money to finish the film. And we went back and held the cast together for six weeks. That's the interruption. Which is, which is in itself a miracle. <laughs> had a little trouble with Gary Merrill. He didn't want to come back. And, that's a story in itself. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, we were talking earlier, one of your favorite films is All About Eve, and I realize you have two, two uh, All About Eve casts. That's right. Gary Merrill yeah. and Thelma Ritter. Thelma, Thelma's extraordinary in the film. It's a fascinating group of people. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're all very disparate types of acting styles here. Uh, I studied with Stella Adler, the other people at the actor's studio, the neighborhood playhouse, and Thelma Ritter. And Gary Mello, who had never done any of that at all. Thelma was an old-fashioned, old-school actress. And I met her, and she read the script and said she wanted to do it, and I explained how I wanted to do the film. And what we did is we had a rehearsal period in which I rehearsed with each one of the groups separately for a day. We didn't have a lot of money, so I couldn't do it for a long time. I had each of them for a day, and we did improvisations with the two of them, and then brought the two guys in and worked together for the few hours, and then at the end of that week, I took the whole cast and put them in a simulation of the car and uh, did an overall improvisation. And the, the point of the improvisation, frankly, was very simple. If those people in the car didn't understand the fear that locked them in their seats, then the film was stupid. Uh, and we started, and we did it, and it was very, very difficult, as you can imagine. Uh, we started the scene, and first the two guys said to me, listen, Larry, I want you to go in there and tell everybody we're really nice guys. And said, come on, guys, we're all grown-ups here, all professional actors. And he said, no, no, you... So I went in and I said, they're really nice guys. I'm going to try. Okay. <laughs> when we started, and it was awful. Nothing happened. They kind of danced around and made jokes and did stuff. We knew he had to commit, and Tony knew he had to commit, and... They both did, and he finally had to commit where he knew he had to commit, and that was with Brock and with Ruby. And he did, and what you saw in that film is what happened in that rehearsal hall. And when he stood up, I ran across the room and grabbed him and pulled him into my arms, and I looked around, and the room was frozen. And I said, that's what the film is about. That's what we're starting to do. Rehearsal's over. I'll see your first day of shooting. And that's what happened. And so a lot of that... That whole scene with the homosexual character and Marty Sheehan was an improvised scene, and that we improvised, looked at it, recorded it, and didn't have a lot of time here. They weren't giving me freedom of brain here. And then we took that and siphoned it down, took the stuff we wanted, went back and did it as a scene. It was a very exciting film to make. And there's old Thelma. She said, Larry, I never did this kind of stuff. I don't know what improvisation is. I read the script and I said, would you give it a try? She said, sure I will. Well, we did. We, we started to improvise with she and Jack and the two guys and uh, she went along with it. And out of that came that moment when she slapped him. There was nothing in the script about that. She, all she realized afterwards was that she had to do something to defend this guy, and so that's what, she, what came out of it and went in the film. And there are a lot of those moments in the film. The whole sequence with uh, 
with Brock and Ruby, we didn't like the script. The two guys, the two of them didn't like the script. So that Ruby's husband, uh, Ossie Davis. Davis, sneakily rewrote that scene without anybody knowing about it. And uh, the, the writer and I started to get into problems before the film. He wanted to read the script to me out loud. And I said, listen, we don't have to do this kind of stuff. And only he insisted. And then he started to read the, the black characters' lines in Duke using some kind of bizarre Negro dialect. <laughs> and I said, that's it. We're done. And uh, you know, so there you are. And then the end of the film, my wife says, i got to tell you the story. At the end of the film, when the police come in, uh, what happened, Brock said to me, Larry, you can't hang me out here. You can't just have me go back to that seat, collapse, and not finish with our characters. And I said, I know. I know. What are we going to do? I don't know. I thought, oh, let me think about it. Well, we got to the last day of shooting. I came in that morning, and I said, I have an idea. And he said, what? I said, well, in my way of thinking, those cops are going to come in that car, and they're going to look around. They're going to nail you. He said, oh, come on, Larry. They'll never let you get away with it, guy. As Brock had told me stories about his life being laid out on streets in Los Angeles on his stomach, and of course he would drove a Mercedes, and a long story. Anyway, we were talking, and he said, I would get away with it. In the meantime, the extras came into the car, those cops, the ones with badges, and one guy, little guy, <laughs> wearing a coat, and he had a badge hanging on, and he looked around the car, and Brock and I were standing over there talking, and he walked over to him and looked at him and said, I'm going to get you. <laughs> and Brock turned and he said, okay, whatever you want. <laughs> and that's how that ended up as part of the film. So it was an extraordinary experience for me, the whole film. It's extraordinary watching it. Yes, sir. What, what was it like for that uh, little girl in the middle of all of that? You never knew what was going on. Okay. <laughs> we didn't have her there the whole time, obviously. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was very complex shooting. We had, you know... It, she, we protected her. She had really, there was almost, she's never there. And some of the master shots we keep, first of all, you're only allowed to use a child that age for an hour a day or two hours. It's very, very strict. And so we kept her in school and we played with toys and all that and bring her in and put her in the corner. Okay. And I didn't even think once in a while we used her. We had other girls dressed and okay. brought them in so that they never were involved in any of it. They knew she never was witness to any of it yeah, except yeah. the last moments and <coughs> hugged down and nothing happened. She was. Yes, sir. Please elaborate, if you could, on the casting. You had quite an interesting mix of film veterans, up-and-comers, big people. I know. How did that all come together, and how much influence did you have? Well, I had some influence. I didn't have all. I was brought into the film. They had the film was set to go, and they hired the guy hired me. He hired me. Very bizarre. That's a long story. Some of the producers, you can imagine them. These two guys. One of them we never saw again because he was the one who supposedly had the money. He disappeared. <laughs> the, the other one is anyway. He, I came in and I uh, think he was very good. He opened up, you know, a lot of things like, for example, uh, I don't know. I had casting. I Bo. Uh, they pushed Marty on me. I met Marty. I said he's the best. I couldn't ask for anything better. Uh, I, I had a great deal to do with a lot of it, and some of them I didn't at all. You know, the, the gay character I cast, uh, I cast, I cast, Thelma. Uh, I met most of them before, I, you know, none of them walked on blind with me. The only one, this, you know, this was a television show. Did any of you know that? Mm -hmm. This was produced as a television special, which I never saw. Mm -hmm. And the only character in it who was in the film is the lead. He was the only guy in the film, nobody else. Uh, Tony Musanti. Tony Musanti was the only one. He played it on television, and it was a terrific show. I, mean, I never saw it, I never, you know, I didn't want to see it, I didn't want it to affect me, if you will. And uh, he was the only holdover. Everybody else was recast in the piece. Joe Ferrone. Joe Ferrone. Was it just an hour long special? Uh, no, no, I think it was a two, I think it was a nine hour long. Yeah, it was a full length piece. Interesting. Yeah, it was. You can look it up, I don't remember. <laughs> David Susskind. Was, was it called The Incident? Yes, it was. Yes. And and how about Ed McMahon? Uh, he I'm seems to be Ed that outlier in the cast. Ed McMahon is very interesting. He's a story in itself. Ed is what, what we used to, what we call in the business, that's called stunt casting. You know, I don't want to sound cruel or anything. And Ed turned out to be a terrific guy. He's a wonderful man. And 
he'd come in every day and say, Larry, my Jewish director, how are you? And I would say, I'm fine, you big Irishman. And we'd go on. <laughs> we had a great time, but acting was a loose thing with him. He, was, you know, he had a very different idea than I did about performing. And I knew that he wasn't going to understand a lot of it. He was willing to try anything. But the script, for example, called for him when he's holding him and the, the bad guy is pushing at the child and he's getting more and more excited. The script had, was filled with lines. Don't touch my child and if you come near me again, I'll blah, blah. Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe that when we're faced with that kind of fear that we come out with all kinds of marvelous lines. Usually we're close to wetting our pants and fear, terrified. Sometimes we giggle, sometimes we cry. Sometimes we moan or scream, but we don't utter lines of dialogue. But he said, Larry, it's my lines. I've got to be. So I said, OK, we'll try it. So I went to the young woman, Diana Vanderbilt, who was playing his wife. And I said, what would you do? She said, I wouldn't want him to say a damn thing. And I said, right, what are you going to do to stop him? And she said, well, I said, I put my hand over his mouth and shut him up. So if you watch him, he starts saying those lines. He whap, she blocks her hand. <laughs> it got him more and more confused in that moment when Tony was choking him. He virtually dislocated his neck and shoulder while he was doing it. So we put him through hell. And that fear on his face is very, very real. Actually, in the, before the scene, I made him come in. And instead of having a stand-in for the lighting, we made him stand in. And I was not very pleasant to him that day. And then before the scene started, the two boys came on the set and faked out a fight and had a terrible screaming argument. And at which point, he was. And I knew it all the time after that. I knew it. <laughs> but he was shaking with fear before we even started the piece. And so and we, I, we did a lot of tricks in there and a lot of acting stuff. The cast was splendid. Everything was marvelous. As I said, we had a lot of trouble with Gary. Gary was a wonderful actor. And he was a guy with a serious drinking problem and it invaded some of his work. They'd call me at 1 o'clock in the morning and say, He's at the Russian tea room and he's standing on a table reciting Shakespeare. Oh, <laughs> get out of bed and take a cab and go over. There. Come on, up the thing and take him back to the hotel. But that's how that goes. Anybody else? Did I leave anything out, Ben? Victor? <laughs> Just one thing I noticed because, you know, we was in it a lot was all the advertisements you were talking about at yeah. the top, like the NATO one or the one about working with people with mental handicaps. Is there like a thought process behind using those? No, like, no, 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 don't look for any meaning in that. Like, <laughs> just what we were allowed to put in. We didn't use any commercials. We weren't going to be okay. selling Chesterfield cigarettes or whatever. And so that was what happened. Yes, no, sir. no product place. No, no. The, the shooting was really innovative, I thought. The, some of the close-ups, hmm. the early close-up of Martin Sheen and uh, of uh, the two two guys waiting for the... Yeah, before the mugging. Yeah, and then on the, on the train, a lot lots yes. of innovative things with the spacing and the uh, points of view and that sort of thing. It was just very innovative and very interesting to watch. Thank and you. the tension for me, yeah. when the Felix character is just about ready to go, yeah. that just that all of that interaction between all the characters and everything is just very yeah. wonderful to watch. Yeah. I'll tell you a story. We had a cast of man who got mugged. How do you cast a guy who gets mugged? This guy came in again, told me, what can I do? What can I say? And he said, you stand there. So I said, why don't we do a little improvisation? And he, I don't think he was much of an improviser. He was a, a one-line actor. You know, he really didn't have much to say. So I said, let's do a little improv. And I had the two guys with me, obviously, in the thing. And I said, uh, let's start. Go. So I sat down. I was sitting across the room in the rehearsal hall with my feet up on a table, smoking, which is what I was usually doing in those days. So I was smoking, watching them. And uh, Tony ran over to him, both of them did, and he came over to him and he said, give me money, give me money, give me money, give me money, and he kept saying it over and over again. And this poor guy stuck his hand in his pocket and committed the one crime that no actor should ever commit. He brought an empty hand out and indicated that he had money in his hand. Yeah. At which point, Tony, oh, you son of a bitch, he said, you have no goddamn language flying, and took his fist and hit him in the hand, boom, and his hand went back and hit the wall. Mm -hmm. like, oh, God! And they were on him, and I'm sitting across the room, I mean, I'm 20 feet away, at which time Tony, who had a plastic knife on him, pulled it out, and before I got to him, Marty was choking him, and Tony was stabbing him countless times with the knife, 
and we finished and I said, what are you guys doing to me? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously we had to cast him and he was fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. Look, I was, he was acting was so terrible. You learned that in acting school, no indicating that allowed. <laughs> yes. Uh, what was the public's reaction to the film when it was released? Oh, questions about the public reaction. Okay. When it was released. We'll start with the critics. We got great reviews, except one. That was Bosley Crowther. And with that guy, if you didn't get Bosley Crowther, you couldn't open what quote unquote was an art house film. And this was obviously an east side, a small theater film. Uh, we did open it on Broadway, and I'll tell you what happened that day at the theater that was quite amazing. It was, but he gave it a rap because of the violence. Now the violence in the film was totally restricted by the people who run the board in Hollywood, and they told me that I had 17 seconds to do that fight between the two guys, including the beating, the whole thing. And it's, if you want to clock it, it's exactly 16 or 17 seconds. And so they watched us carefully, so the violence of the piece was really very minimal, except for the mugging and the killing at the beginning. You don't know if he's killed the man or not, which is what we wanted to leave it that way, but uh, so there. Anyway, Crowther wrapped the film, the violence, and that year he also managed to get himself fired by wrapping Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> we were small potatoes. Bonnie and Clyde, it was a, it was a great film. And they, he destroyed it. And he was finished. That was the end of his career. He was a great reviewer, by the way. He was not a foolish reviewer at all. And he'd been really nice to me on one potato. So, but there you are. Now, where was I? Where was I? How was it received in New York? Oh, well, you said that, and then you opened on We Broadway. opened in New York at the Victoria Theater on Broadway. I think it was the Victoria. Anyway, it was there, and there was a large black audience to see part of the film, half, about half the audience was black. And uh, I don't know if any of you have ever gone to see films in theaters that are mostly black audiences. They get very verbal and they take part in the filming and they, their feelings, they clearly show their feelings. Well, we got to the end of the film. Everything was quiet, everything was fine until that policeman came in and busted Brown. And they became electric. It was terrifying began pounding the floor with their feet, standing up, hitting the walls. And I got terrified. I really didn't know what was going on. I got up and I walked, I ran out of the theater. I walked into the lobby and everything calmed down after that. But that was, the audience reaction to it was extraordinarily powerful. It was, I don't you know, what can I tell you? It was, uh, well, you, the same thing happened here. No, nobody jumped up and said, ooh, ooh, ooh. But that audience, it was literally terrifying. I've never felt anything like that in my life. It was electric. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I had a question. Well, I'm just wondering to tail go on the end of that one. Is like, how did the, how did you as a group of performers and, and creators kind of decompress after that? Because I think well, it was frankly, it was very very difficult. And the big key here was that every day I had to let those two guys go home. Now I don't know how much of you guys know about acting in terms of actors of that kind of school, of you know of the. Actors Studio, The Neighborhood Playhouse, Stella Adler, they bring a great deal of reality to their work. And so that I felt it was my job to decompress those two guys every day that we went home. And one night I stayed and I came up and I saw he was flying. He was not letting go of that character. Musanti or? Musanti. Yeah. Marty was okay. Marty, Marty was, you know, not that, but Tony was absolutely crazed and I really got worried and sat there. It took me an hour to sort of calm him down and cool him out when I knew he was back in. I said, go home, go sleep. It was a very tough film. We all came together in the most extraordinarily unified group of people. It was, it was quite amazing. It was, uh, it was electric every day coming to work as a result. For example, that shot when Bo Bridges stands up and the camera zooms in on him the focus puller on the show was Jerry Hirschfeld's son, Alec, who became and went on and became a cinematographer in his own right and a very fine one. And he was the focus puller, he was a young kid. And it's a very difficult job. And doing a zoom like that is very hard on a 10 to 1. You whack it and it, he had to be, in, well, we did it. 
we did the scene and you could see Bo and what happened it was it was electric and boom and it was over and we you got to turn to him and say well how'd it go and there was a long beat of silence and he said uh, I think I better need to have another one <laughs> well I didn't take it too well but I said when well, I got to the breath when Jerry listen Jerry was a tough guy I told you Jerry was a very tough guy he and I did seven films together. We never had a bad word between us ever in all of those films. But around me, bodies were laying on the ground. <laughs> Jerry was a he was a tough guy. He didn't he didn't take well to people not doing their job well. Well, he turned on the kid and went around and got easy, take it easy. You think I think I got it. I need another one for protection. Well, we did another one. Thank God it came out fine. But that I, we went to lunch right after the shot, and when I came back. I'll never forget it. There was nobody on the set. I was, you know, I ran back in to do what I want to check my shots list or whatever I was going over, and there was Alec Hirschfeld standing in the corner crying. So I'm going to choke up here. It, uh, that's what happened on this movie with the crew, with the actors, with all of us. And that was that was the making of the incident. Of the incident. Yes, sir. Yeah, just uh, I thought it was chillingly realistic. I mean, there was something about being on the New York subways that uh, in those days were really, really tough. And so, did the did the subway system have a reaction to the to the incident? No, did they, did no. They just kind of ignore it. Hope they, they just right? denied it. At first, they wouldn't let us near it, and they came brought police to stop us. Yeah. So it, well, it was very, very tough. They couldn't stop our actors. We had them walking up when the. Thelma and Jack walk up the scene. They couldn't. We were off, on you know, on cranes, off it, trying, you know, right, ready, doing our shooting. Or when they were up on those stations, we were on rooftops and all that, getting all those shots. But we weren't allowed to put a foot on it. And they denied. They said, "This is a lot of baloney, you guys. You how dare you say that any violence occurs on our subway?" Did they say that publicly, or was you better believe they did? <laughs> We have time for one more question. Is there? Yes. Um, getting back to the public reception, was the film seen widely around the country? It, it was, and we did pretty well. It was, they did a foolish thing. And uh, by the way, 20th Century Fox was fantastic. Dick Zanuck was fantastic. We brought him the print, we brought him the cut, and he made one change in the whole thing. He asked us to do that mugging early. Mm -hmm. which I think was a really good idea. It set the meat, the film is set from that moment on. It actually occurred after you met all of the people and then right before he could, they got on the subway. And he, he said, Larry, I'm not going to make you do it. And I said, listen, I'm sitting there and this editor-in-chief was Barbara McLean. You know her credits as an editor? No. Oh, dear God, she made, I know, she did everything from, you named from, I think, how green was my valley. Oh, so she was one of the great editors of the 30s and 40s and 50s. And she became head of editing, and they were marvelous. They never said a word. They were cooperative and helpful, and but they did a, made a mistake. They thought we have a law in the in the academy that in order for a film to be eligible, it has to run for a week in Los Angeles and New York, or one or the other, or both. And they said, well, we're going to do it because we think we have some Academy Award nominations here. Mm -hmm. So they put it out. Well, they opened it. And they reviewed the film. And the film got great reviews in Los Angeles. And they finished the week. We disappeared. We opened the film seven months later. Didn't mean a damn thing. Mm -hmm. you know? So I remember, I remember the preview. This is the last year I'll tell you. The preview, we previewed the film at a theater in, in, near Beverly Hills called the Fine Arts Theater. I don't even think it's open anymore. It's on Wilshire Boulevard near La Cienega. And we walked in, and the producer was a shambles. He was a nervous wreck. We all were so nervous. We were very nervous about the film because we knew the content and it was in black and white. And we sat down and a big crowd came and, you know, tonight see this, and I'm with, but usually they put you with the wrong kind of movie, which they always do. And so the, the thing, spoke, we were ready to start. Lights dim. We're sitting in a special area where they save seats for the people in the studio. And <laughs> I'm a, there's a little Jewish couple sitting behind me. <laughs> and the lights went down, and the 20th century Sig came up 
in black and white, bum, 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 bum. and the guy behind me said, oh my God, it's black and white. <laughs> and I said, oh dear, <laughs> we're in trouble. And we got up and left. Come on, Sandy, we're out of here. So, <laughs> the movie did pretty well. We did quite well in Europe. It became kind of a cult film in Italy and in France. And, <coughs> had some extraordinary experiences in Europe about it. So he, I don't think the film made a lot of money, I can tell you that, because I, I never saw any, you know, uh, I don't even know if I had a profit participation in it. If it was, it never happened. The movie cost $795,000 to make all in. And uh, this helped really start my career, because out of that, I moved on, and then I did Goodbye Columbus, and my career started to go. So uh, it's a very important film, a film I really care about, and watching it today, it really, me out so same here I thought it's just terrific scene again thank you so much for coming in